Great. So um, I really want to thank you guys for coming. I mean, I'm really excited about this group, the education group, because I feel like education is sort of like the foundation to a lot of things. And also I feel like this group can really highlight a lot of things that maybe professionals can take forward and, and do and make improvements, basically. But before we get started, I just wanted you guys to introduce yourself. Yeah, so my name is Elias Mba, and I'm originally from Cameroon. Um, I immigrated to Canada in 2010. Uh, my educational background is uh, um, around education and then making that transition to social work. Um, there, sometimes I teach um, uh, post-secondary uh, students in Calgary, casually, who are doing human services. Hi there, my name is Michaela Harris. Um, I am a teacher. I have a, also a bachelor's in international development studies where I focus on education. I've taught in Mexico, in Kenya, in Macau, and most recently Dubai. Um, I was born in Canada and first generation on my dad's side um, because he was born in Somalia. Hi, my name is Noel Bahalavi. I'm a youth facilitator here with the Real Me program. Uh, I, my studies are in public policy and economics, and I recently studied the international political economy in the United Kingdom. I was born in Canada, right here in Calgary. Both my parents immigrated to Canada from Eritrea in the mid 80s. So, my name is Francis Boche. Uh, I work at the Center for Newcomers, and originally I'm from Ghana. I also teach as a social at the Faculty of Social Work, University of Calgary. Okay, well, thank you for the introductions. I guess I'm just going to dive right in it. Um, I just want to ask any of you guys, personally, like outside of professionally, in, in Canada, how has your experience been? Like, have you come across any barriers, any racism or things that you face? Yeah, just I think it's always interesting being biracial. Um, one of my first memories is I was always introduced as being um, half black um, by my classmates um, when there was a new teacher or a new student and then kind of having to navigate then the person's response to that um, and like riddled with microaggression because then someone might have a comment or, or something like that. Um, so yeah, I really feel also as a teacher, my experience is um, I'm able to kind of hone in when I, when I notice that happening with other young people. It was so normalized and I basically learned a script. Um, I wish I had a pamphlet because it happened so often. So well, uh, well I, so I did my bachelor's on uh, and the master's in social work at the University of Calgary. It was actually at my at the, at the undergrad level that I, I, I witnessed, um, uh, especially during classes, I, I witnessed um, uh, a division, physical division in, 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 in the classroom. And then I was, uh, I was shocked that uh, the content of uh, some of the courses um, were not uh, in uh, were not were not in accordance with the Canadian policy of multicultural culturalism, and so African students did not. Um, it was challenging for us to actually find some type of content that will actually spur us up coming from the African continent to say, oh, um, Africa is being represented in some of this course material. I also um, uh, noticed um, when, uh, as a social worker moving from one school to another, um, how there is uh, differences between um, uh, black kids, especially the African kids, and other population. Uh, a good example is um, schools actually pushing African kids to um, graduate high school 
with what we call the K and E. And I actually had to fight with a few schools. And if they believed in that, I am asking myself, why did they change it after I advocated, right? One other thing that bothers me uh, is this co post-coding, how uh, resources are allocated. As a social worker and as a teacher, I am wondering if resources should not be allocated to populations that are struggling. The, the box, sort of box they place a lot of young people in, however um, directly or indirectly, but I, I feel like there's a lot of labeling that goes on that sort of, which is unfair because it directs someone's future in a way that, that um, it shouldn't really be. And it's really based on biases. Like I, I can give you an example, Elias, of what you spoke about. I remember I was working with a young black boy who was really tall and athletic and, and, and they, the school was really pushing me to like sort of turn to get into basketball and stuff. So when, one time I was talking to him and he said, I'm, I'm more than just basketball. And that hit me deep because I was, I felt like I was part of the crowd. Like, go, you're athletic. And it's a typical sort of black boy, athletic. That's really where you're going to find your success. But he pointed out to me, he was more than just basketball. He wanted to focus on academic. He wanted to go into real estate and architecture. But they just weren't, they were blocking every avenue in his eyes to, to go down that direction. Yeah, I definitely, I can definitely understand what that young guy is saying. And for me, growing up in Calgary, you know, 20 years ago, was, it wasn't as diverse as it is today. So you deal with a lot of stereotypes. You deal with a lot of people that, for me at least, surprised that you're in university, surprised that I'm articulate or I speak English well. Um, that, you know, you're tall, you're going to play basketball, you're going to play sports. It's a lot of those assumptions where they just kind of, you know, if you're not in a very diverse space and your only ex interactions with other people is through television, and then you just kind of build those stereotypes, whether they're from the U.S. or where they're from, they're watching movies from Asia or Africa, they kind of just label you with that. And they kind of just kind of don't really give you an opportunity to kind of show your personality or even shape your personality because you are placed in categories. Honestly, when I was younger, I didn't deal with a lot. I'm sure I just, you just internalize a lot of it. You kind of just accept it that people are going to be surprised that you speak English well, even though you grew up there and you went to school with them. People are going to be expecting you to be good at sports or they're going to be, think you can rap really well, very things like that where, you know, you're you're gonna you're gonna start developing your own interests in secret almost because you don't actually want to break from the norm, and there is that pressure to fit in the norm. And then you also can start feeling that pressure from other people of color who are looking at each other and saying, "Why aren't you what? Why aren't you behaving like how they expect us to behave?" I've been to, I've studied in different countries, I've worked in different countries, and I think um, when I traveled to Russia, the first time I left Ghana was when I went to Russia to study. At the time, I never had in my mind that there was anything that had to do with the person's color. That would result in hatred, right? And it's not that nature. And so after Russia, I went to Norway to do my master's. So that was when it began to be clear to me that indeed um, racism was an issue. And then when I came to Canada, it is like everything came together when it came to issues of racism. So, and in all these countries, I had experienced racism, except that in, in Russia, I had no clue that those acts of hatred were the result of racism. Norway, I graduated in my understanding of racism. And in Canada, they all came together to consolidate a position about what racism at a personal level meant to me. And so personally, I have experienced racism in the form of marginalization. So this is what I call marginalization racism. When people simply would marginalize me in, in terms of what I in, in at a personal level, in the workplace, or even just just been in the mall. And I think 
I experience this thing again on a very incremental basis. Because there are certain times you are just oblivious of certain things because you don't think that human beings will be doing that. And then it begins to become a pattern. And so that pattern translates into some understanding that something is really happening. I've been in situations where people have been so intimidated by me, and the way they explain it is because, oh, you are so, maybe so smart, or so this and so that. But that may be true, but under, underneath that, maybe a sense that who are you to be able to do what you are doing? And it is also a result of who I am, by virtue of how I appear. So, and just like Elias was saying, there are certain times I've also experienced personal racism when I'm just in the classroom teaching. And the manifestation here is very subtle. Because um, the first question someone is going to ask is, did I pay my fees for such a person to be teaching? Until they begin to know how, how much you know, then the dynamics change. I've been in situations where in the mall, um, people have followed me, you know, just to ensure that I'm not in the mall to, to steal something, you know, all those kinds of things. And anywhere I go, especially my early years in Canada, um, I began to see some of this. I was coaching a soccer team, made mostly of white kids and a few black kids. And even in that, to see some of the racist um, tendencies coming from some parents. And I was doing this for free, for just my contribution to young, I like young kids. So just getting them there and then getting them, you know, involved in sports. And I've also experienced racism, even just simply sitting in the bus. Where people just look at you as an exotic being, you know, someone from an alien or maybe something like that. And you ask yourself, this is 2020 or this is 2019. And yet, there is this sense that people, perception people have about you that cannot be explained, actually. It can't be explained from a human perspective. So, and all these levels of racism, um, marginalization racism I've experienced, alienation racism I've experienced as well. So in a nutshell, this, this is a story of my personal encounters at the U of C, I actually confiscated a petition paper that was circulating in class because of uh, um, against uh, a, lecture, a lecturer, an instructor who was not Caucasian. And no matter what they did, I put the paper in my pocket and I said it is not going to go through. We were actually writing an exam and I confiscated it, put it in my pocket and I, I, I didn't. I was intimidating at that time. And a Caucasian lady from, from Quebec came to me and started crying why white students were doing that against a non-Caucasian teacher and actually telling me I think that lady did write a letter, a letter to that instructor, right, to show her support. And so, um, next one is con connected to the content. I was always tired because I was doing security while studying. And my classmates were so close to me that they always sent me the material. They told me, Elias, watch a video that an instructor, I think she was from Asia or somewhere in Europe. It was a video of Ghanaians going down the hill, carrying a um, uh, son to get paid. And the lecturer, the instructor said, modern slavery in Africa. The class ended with me because I wanted her to explain. And then she said it was not her video. You chose the material, right? People are working. And then I said, I came to Canada with a master's degree in education. 
I was offloading five, seven trailers a day in a warehouse and paid $14. Would you call that modern slavery in Canada? Right? So the contents like that puts some students who are not uh, assertive, who are, who are not confident into a little bubble, and they will feel that those type of jobs are left for black students. There's a, I heard a lot of internalization from Noel, the lack of advocacy, at least you were old enough to be able to advocate for yourself. But in our current school systems now with the young people that go to school, our young black people, what are the concerns that you may, you know, that you may have around the education system and like the content or, or the biases or certain things? Excellent. Um, it's a major concern. I like to work as a kindergarten teacher because it really sets the tone for so much. Um, and it's shocking when kids bring in their family bias. They don't come in um, into this earth with it. They come in bringing whatever they've been hearing. Um, and kindergarten, I've had a lot of coworkers say, they're too young, they don't understand. And so by not doing anything, by not addressing when we hear um, these shocking things, uh, it, it sets the tone that it's acceptable and, and allowed. Um, something else that I wanted to touch base on was that coding and was that putting into boxes. And people don't realize that it's teachers who do that. Um, starting in kindergarten, I will write a referral where that child will go. And I'll tell you what, once a kid is streamed, it is so hard to advocate them back, like you were saying, Elias. Um, so I think having also representation and more teachers of color teachers who have just experience in, in understanding different, different ways of learning, um, where these kids are, are coming from, where they can have an, uh, an equal footing, I think, starting from day one. So with all, when, when young people come in with those values or those, those learnings from home, what are the sort of things you do to make sure that um, it's corrected? Because that is the thing with Canada. We're very subtle. And, and when we overlook things, that, that's the biggest issue, I think. I, I, it sounds very easy, but I just say to the kids, that hurts my heart. So it's not a rule. It's not a we don't say this. I say, wow, that really hurt my heart. And then I explain it. And then I ask, did it hurt anyone else's heart? And it, it becomes something like, oh, we hurt somebody on the inside. Um, rather than policing or regulating, or, oh, we don't say this. Um, and it's, it, it needs to be started in day one. Yeah, I think they both highlighted a lot of it comes down to kind of that experience in the classroom. Um, and it, you know, I'm part of this board called the Coalition for Equal Access to Education. And they actually re released a report about racism in the classrooms and one of the things they highlight is that Eurocentric curriculum in the classroom that you know when you portray the history of Canada as European settling Canada where we really should until reconciliation came about we really didn't go into detail about the treatment of indigenous populations about the long the multiple generations that have lived in of Asian Americans living in British Columbia the uh, the amount of free black slaves that came from the U.S. that have settled in Halifax and Nova Scotia, that the history of Canada is, has always been multicultural. It's never just been a recent immigrant wave. So that if you just entrench in this mind that you just came here or your parents came here and you're just kind of a visitor in this country, you're kind of left in this little limbo in the middle where you don't have that belonging. And there is that other aspects where there's that misdiagnosis, there is lower expectations, there is putting students in ESL when they shouldn't be in ESL. There's all these things that kind of degrade, kind of break down their confidence in themselves because they're constantly being told, you are different. Your family came to this country, you are different. You don't, you're hearing a different language at home that makes you different. And then you don't really ever build that confidence to kind of achieve or kind of work towards things that people might have shown that's out of, out of reach. I just want people to understand that the more you push people against the wall, like the more you tell a young person you're not going to do this, you're not going to achieve this, 
no matter how hard they try, there's going to be a point where they just give up. And so when you see sort of disruptive behavior or when you see certain reactions, and I, and I do believe that a lot of the responses they get is, is, is geared towards how they've been treated, it comes to a point where sometimes you sort of understand the explosion. You sort of understand the attitude because it's the frustration of hitting yourself against the wall or being told that, no, you're not going to pass this or no, you can't graduate with a high school diploma. When you know deep inside you can, but there's certain barriers that, that, that hinder you. Well, I wanted to also uh, connect with what Michaela um, said about kindergarten and, and school age and, uh, and uh, children. Well, we are neglecting uh, the immigrant, the African immigrant mothers and fathers who moved to Canada after being educated back home to start all over again. And I teach them, and what they say is exactly what the kindergarten kids are saying to you. Are you sure that we are, will be able to make it? If we graduate, are we sure that they will give us the job? I don't think they will give us the job. They put themselves in a, no, they have been forced to put themselves in a bubble. And so my job is not only to instruct them, it is also to make sure that they come out of that bubble. One more thing, because I, my accent, which I will never ever try to change, right? A guardian counselor had a meeting with me. We had a meeting. And then when, after the meeting, I gave her my card. She didn't say I wasn't educated before. She didn't say anything, but when I gave her my card and she looked at it and then she said, oh my God, you have done a lot of schooling. And so prior to me giving her my credential, she probably thought that I was not as educated as she is all the people who will come and um, so they really get it they put uh, support workers facilitators into that bubble of limited um, education because of our colors of our colors of skin and then our accent so that's something that can actually um, can actually uh, traumatize some practitioners who believed all, the, all along that Canada um, has limited racism. Yeah, and it also a lot of our parents that, that the English may not be their first language or, you know, the, huh, I can't, I can't hear you. I, I don't understand what you're saying. That sort of thing, it's a little things that sort of frustrates that, oh, your English is not good enough or, you know, we don't understand, you know, can you get an interpreter when actually when you speak to them, they're, they're, their English is actually okay. You know, accents, we all have one, even Canadians. And so it's really important to have these awarenesses um, in the back of our mind when we're, when we're working with um, people from the population that we're talking about. Um, Dr. Francis, I really want to come to you because you, you did a great job in the color coding. And when you spoke about the racism, but then also as a lecturer, you must see a lot of the gaps too, or things that concern you. Certainly, I think that um, if I could begin from, because I have kids in the school system, and I think that, you see, colonization is all about subjugation. It's about how people were exploited and subjugated to the extent that their human dignity was taken away. And I think that there's a form of recolonization with our curriculum system here. And the idea, is still to perpetuate or to prolong the period of subjugation through education. So sometimes I just take my kids' um, school books and I will look through just for pictorial, um, pictorial evidence that they are representing Canadians. And in, in like Mark, you look at Mark, you know, and they put pictures in in, in, in these lessons to show how kids are doing things. And it's only on few occasions that you can actually locate 
an image of a black youth. So anytime I go through that, for me, it is like doing a media analysis. When the number of times that a black person appears on media is associated with a certain kind of crime. And so when I look through the books, sometimes I feel very, very discouraged. I look into their social books, and then what do I see? They give all these examples. They choose certain countries to, to, to learn about. And in those countries, you never see Africa. You never see um, any country that is from Sub-Sahara Africa, for instance. And so for me, that is a form of recolonization that is coming through education. Because if I don't find myself represented in anything, that, that hurts me. I'm a human being. And for children, they need to be able to see themselves as being represented in at least the textbooks. And then the content, like Elias was talking about, and at the Michaela as well. The content of the books, what is being talked about, has nothing to do with the kids, some of the kids in the classroom. And so this is why we have a situation where indigenous histories were not taught to even Canadians. Canadian students do not know about indigenous kids. Let alone talking about um, what no Noel was talking about, the emancipation of Africans in, in this country, the slavery that Africans went through in this country. People are not aware of all this. Why? Because they are not included in the school's curriculum. And my reason, or my, my, my idea here is that it is a form of recolonization. Because the more you are unaware of who you are, the less likely you are to be standing up for yourself or refusing to be oppressed. When it comes to um, when it comes to the classroom, when I teach, at the university level, you have the option to, to design your course. You have the option to choose the book you want to use or the materials you want to use. And like I told the story in the color coding, there was once I was teaching Elias' class. I think that was 2014. Um, I was teaching a subject, social work, and that social work, social justice, and diversity. And then I chose a book that was titled um, Challenging Oppression by a Canadian professor. And the book for me is an important book because it does the analysis of oppression through several lenses. So one of the students will always come to me and let me know how she didn't like the book because um, it was attacking white people. And this book is written by a white man. And so I kept on going back and forth with her almost after every class. And like I said, on the last day, she made me a card. And she is a retired teacher. She made me a card, and in that card she said, Dear Francis, thank you for helping me confront my privilege. I was, I was moved to tears because that, that indicated to me that people need to be educated about what they are learning. We are learning to learn, or we are learning to unlearn what we've been taught. And so for me, that was a very powerful goal that I thought I achieved because if professors and teachers would look into the content of their courses, and have an open mind with the intention to liberate people and to get people to really have an open mind in the way they do analysis, I think that we'll be able to change the minds of so many people. And for me, I take the classroom as an opportunity to do that. Just like Michaela was talking about, take the classroom as an opportunity to really infuse in people the values that you hold strong to, values of justice and equality, dignity of a human being and making sure that this comes across in the way you choose your materials, the way you teach. I don't teach to just impart knowledge. I teach to be taught. I want to be taught by students as well. And this for me is a passion. And I teach to liberate in the end. So, and of course, I've seen resistance from certain students, not just this lady I'm talking about, but from other white students, some of whom will let you know that they are not interested in the materials or they are not interested in the book you are using because 
it is not consistent with your worldview. But this is a matter that has to be talked about and discussed, not just at the instructor level, but at the whole university's administrative level. And in the school system, this is what the boards, the school boards have to sit down and think about. This is what the ministers of education will sit down and think about and look at the impact of a distorted form of education on the lives of certain segments of the populations in our classrooms. Um, it's funny because when you talked about that student, it is about getting them to feel comfortable in being uncomfortable because it can be an uncomfortable topic for some people. And, and there's something Dr. Francis didn't mention, which he highlighted the other day, that is not just a black and white thing when we talk about racism. It goes beyond that. And I don't know if, if you can talk to that a bit more, just so that people will be clear, because some people automatically exclude themselves. Well, I'm not white. It has nothing to do with me. But actually, racism comes in all forms. Yeah, just um, early this week, I was having a walk. I normally have a walk in my neighborhood. And I was walking, and these two girls who are not white, they saw me coming and then they made some gestures to each other. And so when I passed by them, they were laughing. So I was, I turned back to them and I, and this, again, these are not white kids. And then they stopped laughing. And again, it is, it is this whole idea that we have a hierarchy in our system. They don't know who you are. They don't know where you come from. They don't know what, what you are about. All they see is what they hear people saying about you or people like you. And so I told them to be very careful. And I walked by and they said, okay. You see, the idea is to let people know that when they do such stupid things, it's important for them to be called out on them. Because, and this, again, this is how society is organized. They hear stories in their homes about us. And they put themselves on the hierarchy. Okay, if these people are first, okay, we at least we are second. And this person coming belongs to the third or the last category. And this is the categorization that I talk about. It is a coding, the color coding system where in people's minds, significance has been given to certain colors. And based on that, we, we are judged. So it's not just white people um, that will do these things. I know people from um, other countries, other parts of the world that are not in the sub saharan region, who also do this to us. Or at least I have felt that in, in several, several, several instances. And in fact, sometimes I feel those ones are even stronger than I'll feel from a white person, frankly speaking. I initially planned to talk about um, academic assimilation, knowledge knowledge assimilation going on in Canada and in North America. And by that, I was looking at the assimilation of Africans back in Africa in the days, and also what is happening with uh, the content of, uh, of, the, of teaching materials. That is actually taking away the Africanness from the Africans, right? If I remember we had a young man that working with, uh, Amal was working with that young man and he was really confused, but very intelligent. And um, I, was, I was helping Amal on that file. One day I sat down with him at his school and started going through Wikipedia about some of the rulers that had ruled um, um, that had ruled Ethiopia, I think. And tracing down, going down, he actually discovered that he was a distant relative of, uh, of Imperial Hale, Hale Salesi, I think, I think that is, uh, his face brightened. He became, he was an assertive young man, but he became more assertive and open-minded, talking to teachers who he is. And from that time onwards, he just flew through his high school. We, we spent a lot of resources for him to play soccer and all the rest, but that made him to believe 
that hey, I've got, uh, I've, I come from uh, a, a family, a culture where they were great people, right? And I, I, I connect, I connect this with the fact that we, the West Africans, I must specify, Francis, myself, Ikene, and people around the West Africa, we studied Canada. When I arrived here, I was confused. I was surprised that I knew more about Canadian um, uh, um, uh, politics, administration, and their agriculture than the students I was sitting in class with. And so when if Canada um, uh, abandoned as the assimilationist policy long, long ago, why are we not checking on that? Every little action has to be checked against those discriminative, uh, discriminative, discriminatory and racist tendency creeping up into um, our society. Why do you think the Shades of Africa conference is important and what would you want um, anyone in the audience, even if there's one person, to take away from, from what you've just spoken about? I'm not sure who's going to be watching this conference, but I hope that one of the people will be in a position to make space for educators to make space for hiring practices where this can be taken into consideration. I'm currently on a wait list with thousands of other teachers waiting for an interview. Um, there is no way that we can have an education system that takes this into importance if we're not even looking at the teachers. We're not even being able to use their skill sets. I mean, it's, it's, Difficult seeing it from the inside all the time. For example, when I do get hired, I'll be placed. I'll be placed in whatever school. Is it a school where I think I can have effective change? Who knows? It'll be the spot I'm given. Um, so yeah, just making space to be able to have conversations, to be able to, um, to make this important. I know it's not just conversation with the children. I guess a, a lot of the staff themselves need like I spoke on it before with the police that I feel like sometimes staff that's been entrenched in like teaching for years and so used to their styles of practice that really finds it difficult to adapt. Um, uh, you're a teacher, I guess. I mean, do you think that may be relevant training for retraining? Cause During my Bachelor of Education, I had to take a class called Diversity where I was taught about myself. Um, it was one semester long and so... <laughs> I just boom, 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 boom. And really assumptive that people in the room did not have any experience um, with migration, with learning multiple languages, with being refugees. It, it just needs to be changed at the teacher training level. And again, making space for people to tell their stories and, and have that important and not something where I get the curriculum from someone who wrote it not knowing who's in my class, not knowing me. Um, so giving us the space to be able to, to write the curriculum, to teach teachers realities um, that it's hard to learn in a book. I think for young people that are of African descent, I hope they kind of see the conference as a way to remind themselves that Africa is this really diverse place and that whether you grew up here or whether you moved here, it's never too late to kind of go on the internet, research, do learn a little bit about your home country, learn a little bit about your neighbors, get to know about your heritage a little bit more, kind of build that understanding, talk to your parents, talk to your relatives, build that understanding to build kind of that, it all adds up to your identity and to those people who aren't of African descent and work with people or live with people or know people who are of African descent. It's also a great opportunity to understand that Africa is not a monolith. You know, we're the only demographic that when you go onto any type of government form, it's the only demographic that's grouped together. Whereas every other demographic, they're broken up by country, by language. But black, for some reason, Africans and black Africans are just all bunched up together where it's a continent. It's 54 countries, thousands of languages, mixes of cultures. So people could take that as an opportunity to challenge themselves to learn more about Africa that 
from an international perspective, there is a lot of ha- there's a lot happening. There's a lot of economies booming. It's not this this very archaic view that I feel like existed when I was a student. That when I told my friends, "Hey, I'm going to Eritrea to visit my grandmother," the first thought in their mind is lions running around and giraffes running around. They don't that it's not this modern place that has been modern for hundreds and hundreds of years. That if you're a teacher and you're going to teach your students about ancient Greece or China, you can teach your students about old kingdoms in Ethiopia or Nigeria, that there has been this rich, rich culture that has just been neglected and kind of written off just because one, there may not be enough information or it's not just, it just hasn't been valued. So I do think Shades of Acted has provided an opportunity for people to just take a second look, reevaluate their, their assumptions and, and kind of take a chance to get to know it better. Well, I am hoping that uh, those who will be watching this video and uh, looking at me in the face should understand that um, we have to, um, uh, the Nigerian man said, you have to sell yourself. If you do not um, uh, confront people and let them know that you are equal or even more than them, they're not going to buy your message. They're not going to change the, the narrative. They're not going, to, um, uh, institutions are not going to change. Like when I had to write down the GPA of my bachelor's classmate and used it in order to get into the university because my GPA was more than theirs, but they got in younger than me, no experience. And I wrote back, the following day, they had to give me the admission. I also want to say those parents, African parents, who have become compliant with uh, um, this type of discrimination in education, racism, and actually normalizing it, are not helping the Canada that they want to make as their home. They are not also enhancing the learning and development and the worldview of their children. Yes, I think um, for those watching this um, video, I think that um, it is a platform for us to really put some recommendations to the teachers and the education system to begin with. I think that um, rather than teachers or the education system initially steering kids from other parts of the world into certain streams of education, they should begin to think of the way the curriculum is designed. They should begin to think about the content of what they teach. They, begin, they should begin to question their own biases and assumptions about certain people. In fact, I was watching the news about six weeks ago when a Somali girl in Ontario whose grade 10 or 12 biology teacher told her she wasn't built for biology. And now this kid, this young girl is in medical school. And that was the only reason why it came on the news. A couple of young black girls going to the university, I think of Toronto Medical School, and her story was featured because she came here as a refugee. And she came here with a desire to, to excel. And for a teacher to make a comment like that, to a young lady aspiring to become something, I think that was very demeaning and very discouraging. And this, uh, there are thousands of such stories based on assumptions and biases that certain teachers possess about certain people. And the whole education system should begin to question some of these assumptions. There should be some real framework by which education of the education system should happen. And that should be very tangible and very straightforward. The second piece is teachers should look at the linguistic intelligence of our young people as a strength. Now, these are cases, I speak seven different languages. Um, my kids speak different languages. So how, how can you underrate a person like that? Like, it's, it's, it's a strength, it's an advantage, it's a capital. And yet, we, are, we accentuate accents and make accent look as if it's a weapon of mass destruction. 
twisty. And then, you know, it's like, you see, it, it, is, it is a way of bringing people down. It is a way of bringing people down. And some of these young people, because of that, they do not want to speak their own L1 or first language because they are so disappointed, I mean, discouraged by teachers, so much so that they don't want to speak about their language or speak their language when they are in school. How do we accept a situation like this? And the third piece I want to say is what Elias talked about. Sometimes parents become so complacent with what is happening. They compare their existence here to where they came from. You see, that kind of comparison doesn't hold water because you are in different contexts and the conditions are very different. So if you're in Canada, you've came with your kids and your kids are telling you things that they're experiencing in school, your responsibility is to listen and to ask questions and to be able to be part of the journey to reinvent a just society from the classroom. Sometimes parents just say, you know what, I mean, you know, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Um, but for the kid, it's not okay. And so we accept or we normalize what has happened and we become part of it. And this is why, even amongst the African community, you have these divisions amongst parents when it comes to topics of racism. Because for some people, there's no racism. We are okay. Why? Because maybe parents are doing a good job. But doing that good job doesn't mean, doesn't, doesn't separate you from the instances of racism that we are talking about. You see, you've only chosen not to look at them, but your kids would have a very different orientation. So they'll be asking these questions. Why should we be, why should we be treated this way? And some of you might have seen the reports that are coming, the research that are coming out. Second generation newcomer youth are more likely to be frustrated than their parents because they came to school, they started grade one with their white colleagues and other colleagues, and yet their situations are not different from their parents. And so that is causing them to be more frustrated. At least we say we came here, we came here, okay, but they were born here. And so we are seeing that level of frustration coming up, and all the research that are currently coming up are showing this trend. So what will happen to your children, to my children, in the next few years, if this continues? The education system should begin to think about ways of making these changes happen so that Canada can be a just place for everyone. Wow, you dropped the mic. It's, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, no, because identity is key for our young people. And, and it's, it, it's really important for teachers or educational institutions to know that sometimes our biases can make or break that. And it's unfortunate that a lot of young people are being broken by certain things that shouldn't be happening in the system. So that's why we are gathered today, because we care and we want young people to succeed here in Canada and they can if only these things are taken into consideration and change is an evolving thing. It's it, will it, willingness to learn and take on board and, and cause more inclusion so that those are not in, excluded, vulnerable people are kept in the loop and, and racism is, is nipped in the bud. We'll continue to talk. We continue not to be silent because I think it's important that our voices are heard, but I really want to thank each and every one of you because I feel like your voices are really valuable. And I really hope that teachers and educators watching here will take a lot from this discussion. Um, so I'm going to leave it there, but I, lead, I really want to thank you guys and appreciate you guys for your time. Thank you very much. <laughs>